When I was a boy, I wanted to become a physicist like my hero Einstein, until I realized the much bigger impact of building an artificial scientist much smarter than myself. My colleagues uh, say that should be easy. And let this artificial scientist do all the remaining work. That's the plan. <laughs> now, I became an artificial intelligence researcher. And it's a good time to be one because AI research is going to make 40,000 years of human dominated history going to converge soon, in a few decades, around the year 2040, which I call Omega. Some call it the singularity, but I like Omega better because that's what Teilhard de Chardin called it 100 years ago. And also because it sounds so much like, oh my God. <laughs> Let me show you this pattern of accelerating, exponentially acceleration in, in the most important events of human history, which started 40,000 years ago with the emergence of Homo sapiens sapiens from Africa. And we take a quarter of that time, omega minus 10,000 years, exactly the next big chapter in the history books, the emergence of civilization, agriculture, domestication of animals, first villages, and we take a quarter of the time, omega minus 2,500 years, that's exactly the uh, axial age, as Jaspers calls it, when all the major religions are founded in India, China, Old Testament, and the ancient Greeks lay the foundations of the Western world as we know it with harmonic mu music, formal reasoning, steam engines, organized sports, democracy, and we take a quarter of that time. And that's exactly the next big advance, omega minus roughly 600 years, the Renaissance, the beginnings of the scientific revolution, the um, invention of the printing press, often called the most important invention of the past 1,000 years, and the exploration of the world, first through Chinese explorers and then through Europeans such as Columbus, of course, Columbus was not the first to discover America, but he did not become famous because he was the first to discover America. No, he became famous because he was the last to discover America. <laughs> and we take a quarter of that time, omega minus roughly two human lifetimes. That's the late 19th century. That's when the modern world, as we know it, emerges, and many of the big companies that still exist today were founded. Electricity for all combustion engines and cars invented, Einstein was born. And the biggest event of them all, the beginnings of the population explosion from a billion to soon 10 billion through fertilizer and then artificial fertilizer. And we take, we take a quarter of that time, omega minus half a human lifetime. That's the year 2000 with the emerging digital nervous system covering the world, the World Wide Web, cell phones for everybody information processing revolution. And we take a quarter of that time, omega minus 10 years. Now that's in the future. And many have noticed that it's really difficult to predict the future. Many learned that the hard way, um, including myself and the guy who is responsible for my investments. <laughs> However, some things can be confidentially predicted, for example, Within a few decades, we will have computers that are faster than human brains. So such computers do not exist yet, but they will soon, because every 10 years, the computational power per Swiss franc grows by a factor of 100 or 1,000. It grows by a factor of 100 uh, as computation time per dollar, because the dollar is deflating so rapidly. <laughs> Now you say, okay, maybe computers will be faster than human brains then, but they lack the general problem-solving software that humans have, which apparently can learn to solve all kinds of problems. But that's too pessimistic, because at the Swiss AI lab, which I'm heading, the Swiss AI lab, it's here in Lugano, in the new millennium, we already developed a mathematically optimal, um, theoretically unbeatable, type of universal problem solvers for living in unknown environments. 
So at least from a theoretical point of view, the blueprints already exist. They are not quite practical yet for several reasons. However, at the same time, we have extremely practical artificial neural networks that work or are inspired a lot by what we have in our brains. Artificial neurons interacting to solve collectively complex problems and learning to do so. In fact, the um, networks developed in my lab are currently winning all kinds of patent recognition competitions. For example, they are now the best method for recognizing connected French handwriting, but also Arab handwriting, but also Chinese handwriting. Although none of us speaks a word of Chinese or Arabic, and our French is also not so good. <laughs> But we don't have to program these things. They learn by being exposed to many, many, many training examples, millions of them. And then from there, they extract their regularities and they learn to generalize. Just a few months ago, we participated in the traffic sign recognition contest. Traffic sign recognition is important for self-driving cars, for example. Many teams around the world participated in that contest, but uh, finally uh, we, we came out first. And the second best result was not by another machine learning competitor. No, it was by humans. <laughs> now you say, OK, maybe you will have faster computers, hu computers faster than human brains, and better pattern recognizers and whatever. But these machines will never be creative. But that's too pessimistic. At the Swiss AI lab, um, in the group that I'm heading, we developed this theory, formal theory of fun and creativity, which nails down the nature of curiosity and creativity and exploration of the world in a way that allows us to implement it on machines. We now have a few case studies of that running, but this is going to accelerate extremely, I think. Um, let me explain in a few lines what is the nature of a creative machine. As you are interacting with the world, you are observing a longer and longer history of data, which you are shaping through the actions that you're executing. Now, all the time, your brain is trying to find irregularities, novel, unknown irregularities in the data, trying to make sense of the world, trying to be a better predictor, better encoder of the data. You can measure any novel regularity as follows. Before you have recognized, discovered the learning, uh, the regularity through some sort of learning algorithm, you need so many computational resources to encode the data. After having discovered the regularity, you need only so many computational resources. Because any regularity means that you have you can save computational resources such as synapses or computation time. You can measure that. That's a real number. That's the wow effect that you are experiencing as you are discovering a new regularity. You can give that wow effect to the separate module which is trying to select actions that lead to more data that has the property that you can learn something about the world, that you can um, discover new unknown regularities. It's possible to build machines that maximize the future expected wow effects or rewards of that time. Just like a physicist tries to come up with a new experiment which leads to more observations that hopefully follow some previously unpublished physical law which allows to compress the data. Just like a composer tries to come up with a new melody or a new sequence of harmonies, regular but unexpected because not yet known, such that you again get this wow effects. Just like a comedian tries to come up with funny stories where the unexpected punchline at the end relates back to the rest of the story in a regular way, such that you get again this type of wow effect. You know, before I came here, I thought this is going to be just another TEDx talk and, and there won't be much of an audience, but you are actually a large audience by my standards. <laughs> the other day I gave a talk and there was just a single person in the audience. <laughs> a young lady, I said, Young lady, it's um, very embarrassing, but apparently I'm going to give this talk just to you. <laughs> and she said, okay, but please hurry. Um, I got to clean up here. <laughs> the formal theory of fun and creativity explains why some of you find that funny. 
If you didn't get all of what I was saying, just look it up on the web. It's easy to find. <laughs> so currently, we just have these little case studies of artificial explorers, curious creative machines. But in a few decades, there will be creative machines that will generate their own self-generated tasks, trying to better figure out what to do in the world and what can be done in it. And they will have more computational power than human brains. And this will have consequences. My kids were born around 2000. The insurance mathematicians say they are going to see the year 2100 because they are girls. <laughs> a substantial fraction of their life they will spend in a world where the smartest things are not humans. But the artificial brains of this emerging robot civilization, which we are probably going to see, and which is presumably even going to spread throughout the solar system and beyond, because space is really nice to robots, not to humans. It's hostile to humans, but nice to robots. This will change everything, much more than, say, global warming. But almost no politician is aware of this thing which is happening before our eyes. It is a little bit like the water lilies in the pond where every single day there are twice as many water lilies as on the day before. But nobody notices it until just a few days before the pond is full. My final advice here is don't think of us versus them, us the humans versus these future super robots. Think of yourself and of humanity in general as a small stepping stone, not the last one, on the path of the universe towards more and more unfathomable complexity. Be content with that little role in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> I wish to thank the organizers for doing a great job and um, for, for the check which I'm going to spend on my kids. I wish to thank my mom and my dad, without whom all of this would not have been possible. <laughs> I wish to thank my kids, without whom all of this would not have been um, necessary. <laughs> and I wish to thank you, my lovely audience, for your patience.